or three minutes that I find uh, stop us from taking action in Finland. First is the belief that nuclear power is the solution. And uh, quite to the contrary, in reality, nuclear power is preventing us from moving forward in sustainable solutions like energy efficiency and renewable energy sources. Uh, the case of Finland clearly, clearly shows that if we choose the nuclear path, if we decide to build new nuclear reactors, that is going to lead to another new nuclear re reactor and yet another and another. Finland has made the decision about building the fifth nuclear reactor, uh, the only Western industrialized country in 10 years to decide to do so. And now there are talks about the sixth reactor and the seventh reactor. So that is an endless road. Don't go down that road. Second belief is that all, all this talk about energy efficiency and renewable energy sources is all good. We all support that, but they are just not enough to meet our energy demands and to reduce emissions fast enough. Um, if we look at the facts about Finland, 80% of our land area is covered with forests. We have 6,000 kilometers of shoreline. We have 500,000 hectares of unused fields. So we have ample opportunities for utilizing wind power, for utilizing biomass from the forests and the fields, uh, uh, growing energy crops. And we are uh, not using these vast resources. I think third myth or third or uh, false belief is that small countries just cannot have an impact on a global vast problem like climate change. And um, this is very common in Finland. We only have five million people. I, I don't know if you have the same issue here in the UK. But always to those people who are arguing that, oh, well, Finland is such a small country, what can we do? I, I like to tell, uh, tell the story of a Finnish company, namely Nokia. Mm. Um, <laughs> in the early 90s, uh, Nokia still used to manufacture rubber boots and car tires, and then it decided to concentrate on mobile technology. And now the company is manufacturing 350 million mobile phones per year. So what was a small company in a small country, very far up north, is now an important global player and is having a major impact uh, on the whole world. So small companies, small countries can and do have an impact if they so decide. Um, well, I was asked to say a few words about the Climate Action Day in Finland, um, so perhaps to go quickly through that. Uh, last year we had about 1,000 people marching in six cities and um, our colleague from, from Germany, Matthias, was was telling about how difficult it is to get people to march on the streets in Germany in December. Well, I think you should come to Finland. <laughs> we might have minus 20 degrees there, so it's sometimes um, a bit difficult to engage people. Well, nevertheless, we had 1,000 people marching in six cities, and we had about, um, about 60 different uh, organizations signing to our demands for a strong post-Kyoto treaty and uh, Finland taking a leadership, leadership role in tackling climate change. And there was quite a lot of media coverage as well. But um, some of the lessons learned and future questions based on this Finnish experience were, firstly, uh, whether we want to mobilize people locally in different cities and towns across the country, or whether we want to concentrate on organizing one big action in the capital. And if we decide to take a local route, uh, we need to support the, the local organizers as well. Uh, because sometimes they are very short of resources and don't have uh, you know, all the necessary tools to organize a, a, a good action. Second question is whether we are satisfied with just one single action every year or whether we want something more permanent. Um, it's usually quite easy to get NGOs to sign um, a declaration or participate in a mass once every year. But if you want to have action in between the action days, that is usually a lot more difficult. Thirdly, about international coordination, especially if you have a handful of people um, marching in a freezing December cold of minus 20 degrees, you definitely need all the international support you can have. And I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about uh, the vision that you know that when you are marching there in the freezing temperature, you know that hundreds of thousands of people just like you are marching at the same time across the world. So that's why we need international coordination and action. Timing, um, I guess it's always the case that planning for the actions and, and, and other, other things starts way too late. Uh, we should find a way 
to uh, build the network and enhance it throughout the year, not just a couple of months prior to the actual action date. Finally, a fundamental question about the whole concept of, of, of action day and March. Does marching really deliver? Is that, I mean, is it really going to have a major impact? And if we want to find other ways to engage people, I mean, what kind of tools should be used? Thank you. campaign with us in the London based group, but he's <coughs> last year also returned to his native Spain. So it's a great pleasure. We will hear from Felix. Felix. Hello, thank you. Hello. Good morning. Or good afternoon already. And I decided to go back to Spain a year ago. One of the reasons was to put climate change on the political agenda there. Because before that uh, it was not in the media uh, people were not talking about climate change at all. So I joined a group called Revalita Day, which we tried to be like a, a kind of campaign against climate change in Spain. We organized a conference at the university in Madrid. And um, from there we, we start to push now to, uh, to build for the 8th of December demonstration. But uh, it was uh, different groups tried to form like a stop climate chaos here in the UK in, back in November, but it didn't work because there were only four groups involved. And from there, uh, we have a demo last 21st of April with more than 30 different organizations involved. There were 10,000 people in Madrid. Um, they all were involved in the Greenpeace, Friends of the Air, and also for the first time, uh, trade unions, the big three uh, trade unions in Spain got involved as well. Um, we tried to build, we were reflecting already about uh, December 8th and the last demo, and I don't know what is going to happen on the 8th of December in Spain, because it's two bank holidays that uh, week. But anyway, we, we have a meeting next Wednesday with all the organizations, and from there we push to, to make it of December a big demo in Madrid or, or in different cities if it's possible. Um, we're planning, because we have plenty of time, six months, so we plan to do talks in associations, talk with neighbors, and put the uh, 8th of December at climate change in everybody's minds in Spain because uh, maybe you don't know but we are like 48% uh, of emissions that kill to really allow to Spain so we have a lot of work to do there and we are su suffering already the consequences we have three years of drought and it's getting very hot in Spain already so I will finish up with us, uh, yes, not to buy property in Spain, please. <laughs> okay, uh, I suspect drought may feature campaign work our next speaker is valid somewhere. Perhaps it's pronounced a bit in regions, but um, now off east with again, the Great East as it was once known. So I'm very pleased to welcome um, Wael Maiden from India. He's the director of the League of Independent Activists from the Lebanon. Uh, Hello everyone. Um, uh, I will be speaking about the uh, Arab world role in the cl in climate change issue. First, uh, a small brief about me. I'm, I'm based in Lebanon, but I have campaigned for 11 years around the Arab world, three years as the Arab world campaigner for Greenpeace. Uh, I would like to start with a small brainstorm uh, about the, the importance of climate change, the relationship between climate change and the Arab world. 
And I don't know if you agree with me, but I believe that the Arab world has a lot to do uh, with the climate change 